When I was a child and throughout my teenage years, I got picked on a lot. I got picked on a lot. And I'm not talking about in school, everybody's circumstance is different. For me, it wasn't in school, it wasn't from backyard bullies, it was at home. It was at home. Most days of my life, I was teased in some way. No matter what I did, I felt like I always came up a little bit short and felt like I always had to be perfect. A common scene around the dinner table, particularly in my kind of preteen and teen years, was we'd be having a conversation, and those conversations could be animated, and they could be fun, and they could be debating, and they could be wonderful and worldly and all that kind of stuff. But every once in a while, the whole table would stop and start applauding and say, yay, Sean, you used a word that had more than two syllables. Yeah. It wasn't physical abuse. I'm not saying that I had the worst. My parents loved me. They told me they loved me. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. But I grew up thinking that whatever I said wasn't quite enough. Whatever I did wasn't quite enough. And that had impacts on my life later on. Those voices that spoke to me as a child spoke to me as my adult self. When I make mistakes, I give a lot of negative self-talk, or I used to, I've worked through that, I do it far less now. But if I make a mistake, I'm like, idiot! How can you be so stupid? And sometimes it would just be in my head, but sometimes I'd actually say it out loud to myself. I'm like, why, why are you saying that? Why are you saying that to yourself? It's the strangest thing. Why are you doing that? And then whenever something would happen that I make a mistake, I would have this tremendous emotional response that was disproportionate to whatever it was. And since I always felt like I didn't quite measure up, I did really bizarre things. Like if someone said, hey, how'd you do on that test? If I got a 93, I'd say I got a 94. What's the difference between a 93 and a 94? Like, I, obviously one point, right? But, <laughs> but like hardly anything. Why, why? It wasn't trying to change, like, oh, I got a D and I told people I got an A. It was like this little thing. Oh, what's your grade point average? 4.74? When is 4.72? Who pays attention to the decimals beyond the 4.7? Nobody. Why? Because I never felt whatever I did was quite enough. I'm not going to ask anybody, because I know these can be painful things. I'm not asking everybody to put your hands up or to not, whatever, whatever you want to do. But can anybody relate to that? Can anybody relate to that. Sure, because the things that happen to us as children shape who we are as adults. The impacts that we have as children shape who we are as adults. And this is one of the reasons why this huge, enormous sculpture, and I'll talk about it, I know the picture is not enormous, but this sculpture to me is so powerful. This is a sculpture that was made during something that happens out in the desert uh, each year called Burning Man. Burning Man. And people gather in this uh, organized yet chaotic environment, highly artistic, all kinds of different things. And this is a sculpture that was created. And just for a matter of perspective, a large person standing would come up to about there. Right about there, the bottom of the foot of this one person. And in this sculpture, what, what to you is the most solid thing in this picture? The child, right? The idea of the child being the original, the solid, the most formative part, the solid part of who we are. And then as we develop, as we go along, there's just like scaffolding that's built over this child. And this child is born love. This child is born wonderfully made. This child is born perfect. Not imperfect, as we're sometimes taught. This child is born loved and fearfully and wonderfully made and perfect. But over time, people will build scaffolding on us. People will tell us different things that we're not stand, that we're not, that we're not 
standing up to their expectations. Some people hear the words, you're not good enough. I don't love you. I've never loved you. I used to love you, but I don't love you anymore. I wish I never had you. I don't think that you're as good as what God says. They don't actually say those words, but that's the meaning. I don't think you're as good as you have the potential to be because you're a woman or because of who you love or because of the color of your skin or because of what you have done or because you have something slightly different than what the perfect norm that some person has in their mind or that the advertisements or something else says your body's not good enough. This stuff builds and builds and just scaffolding over this core, beloved, wonderfully made child. Fortunately, the Bible talks all about how what our true core is. It says a beloved, wonderfully made child of God. And it's not just in the passage you heard right then, and if you're only going to be seeing the recorded sermon online, don't worry, I'm going to be going through it now. But it's not just in the Psalm 139, it's in the Gospels, it's in Corinthians, it's in Galatians, it's everywhere, this idea. But let's go through this particular one, the Psalm 139, and see what there is underneath some of these passages. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. God knows you. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. This is classic Jewish writing, putting things in pairs to make a point. When I rise up or I am sitting down, regardless of whether I'm resting or I am active, you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path. There's that word again, search. God's never leaving or abandoning. God, regardless of where we go, God is searching for you, where you are, to try to remind you of who you truly are and whose you truly are and what that essence is. You search out my path and my lying down when I'm active, when I'm moving, and when I'm also resting. You are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know it. You hem me in behind and before. Now, this, doesn't, this isn't meant to be something scary, right? In today's modern language, hemming somebody in can sound like you're boxing them in. That's not what this means. What this means is surrounding with comfort. Kind of like knitting something and putting a baby in something really comfortable and then coddling them and holding them. So you envelop me, you surround me and hold me and lay your hands upon me. God knows everything about you. Now, sometimes people think that's scary. Because sometimes we're taught this. Be careful. God knows everything about you. Be careful what you do in your own room by yourself. Be careful what you do in this world. Be careful what you think, even the stuff that you think. God can hear. God knows everything about you. So you be Careful, if someone teaches you that God knowing about you is dangerous or bad, run away from that teaching. That is not what the Bible says. That is not accurate. And it's a distorted form of the gospel meant to intimidate you and meant to cause you to be controlled. It says right here, after saying, you hem me in, you know everything about me, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too wonderful for me to believe and too high to understand. My people may not understand this, but God can love you. Even when you make all of these mistakes, God knows everything, and it's saying this is a good thing because God knows everything and loves you no matter what anyway. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Anyone want to take a guess at that one? Where can you go to get away from God's spirit? Nowhere. Nowhere. Correct, correct. Or where can I flee from your presence? Nowhere. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Sheol was the Jewish version 
of where you went when you died. It's not the modern conception of hell that Dante and, the, and some other churches created to get you scared so you had to give a lot of money in order to stay out of hell and that kind of thing. That's not what Sheol was, and that concept of hell doesn't exist. If things don't go well, yes, there's a hell. We'll talk about that some other time, but it's not an eternal, painful, fiery, burning place. That's another thing that was created to control you and control people instead of sharing the radical love of God. If I take the wings of the morning, which means if I am feeling wonderful and light and I'm like a bird in the middle of the morning, or if I am settling in the farthest limits of the sea. Some of you may love the sea, may go on cruises, may sail. Back then, the sea was a symbol of terror, symbol of chaos. It was a place that you were scared to go, that it, people thought that if you got to the edge that it was difficult to go. So whether you're in the most wonderful place or the darkest place, God's hand is still there to hold me and guide me fast, even there. For it was you who formed my inward parts, you who knit me together. Again, that sewing analogy, like hemming me in and knitting me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know well. How many people find this passage comforting? I find this passage comforting. I was talking to some other people this week, and one person described this passage as kind of like walking on the beach on a nice summer day with the breeze blowing and someone I love walking along with me. I just, I just love that. Someone else said it was comforting because it was like a celebration of who I am, a celebration of my life, reinforcing that I am a child of God and that God made me and I am special. See, the challenge is, though, we hear so many other things. We hear so many other things, and so many of us can't accept or don't accept this as the core of who we are. But, 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 but I've done so many bad things. I've done so many things that I regret, so many things that I know are on this list of things that people told me if I did them that I was really in trouble with God. I've, did all, I've done all these things that have told me that if I do this, I'm not this or that, and so now I'm not worthy to come up to God. You are always worthy to come to God. Always worthy to come to God. You are a child of God no matter what. And no matter what other people told you. I know people who as adults are still desperately trying to please and get love from their parents. I know people who are 70 years old who are still doing things trying to please their parents who have been dead for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. This is how this can work. Well, but, but that's a nice psalm, but this person obviously had it all together who wrote it. This person who wrote the psalm was in a good mood, clearly saying how great. No, this person was under attack. The person who wrote this psalm, the context behind this psalm is that this person was being attacked and accused and being shamed. And being told that they might get kicked out of the community, that they couldn't worship, they might not be able to stay in their community, that they were going to be shunned because of things that people thought about them, like all this scaffolding. And this person is saying, God, you know who I am. You created me at the very beginning. You know everything about me, my rising up and my laying down when I'm feeling wonderful and flying up to heaven, or I feel like I'm in the depths, in the depths of Sheol or the sea. You know me, and I am going to hold on to that no matter what all of these other people say about me. Now here's the part that some of you may think I'm a little weird about. There may have been five things already. I'm not going to limit it to this one. This child is the core of who you are. 
The rest of it is scaffolding and adulting around it. This child still exists inside of you, and without creating a split personality, you can talk to that child. You can talk to little Scott, little Dave, little Leslie, little Carolyn. You can talk to them and say, I, if they have been hurt, I am going to protect you. I hear you, I know, and I know you have been hurt, and I am going to try to stop letting that happen any more. You can have that conversation with them. And they may just say hi back. And you can have that conversation. And you can go back to this idea and tell this child that they are wonderfully and fearfully made, that you are wonderfully and fearfully made and beautiful. And whatever other identity has been layered upon you or that you have taken upon yourself to reground yourself in the idea that the only core and most important identity you have is as this child of God who is fully loved, fearfully and wonderfully, beautifully made. I have another way that I'm going to try to get this across. I wrote a song about this for you all. And if I make a mistake while I do it, I'm going to try not to beat myself up too much. There was a time when I was hurting And all that time I couldn't see A little child begging for protection All that time that child was me So take your child by the hand Let them know Cause even when we're older, there's a child inside Who needs to know they are loved So let that child know they're loved You may get just what I'm saying Or you may be sure I've lost my mind But so much of what we feel and do today Comes from that child inside So take your child by the hand And let them know Cause even when we're older, there's a child inside Who needs to know they are loved So let that child know they're loved I don't know how you are feeling today I hope that you're doing all right But no matter what has happened or what you have done God loves that child inside Yeah, you are God's child inside So take that child by the hand And let them know 
Cause even when we're older, there's a child inside who needs to know that you love. Yeah, take that child by the hand and let them know that you loved. Cause even when we're older, there's a child inside who needs to know that you loved. So let that child know 